Okay, I think we'll begin. Um, so hi everyone, thank you for joining Beamer's ONG Crash Course series today. Um, I'm really delighted to introduce again, Dr. Priyanka Ayer, who is a foundation doctor at Newham Hospital. Um, and she'll be delivering this last session of the series, which is on complications in labor and maternal disease. So over to you. Hi guys, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks so much for taking the time to join the webinar. And yeah, this is the last um, part of the ONG crash course. Thanks to everyone that's been joining every week. Um, we've had a lot of fun. Hopefully you guys have learned a lot as well from the webinars. Um, so today, uh, as Sonam said, we will be covering, oh, actually, I'll, I'll come on to that. So today we'll be covering normal labor, preterm labor, induction of labor, and then we'll go through some of the complications that you might see during a labor ward shift. And then lastly, we'll go through two very common maternal problems during pregnancy, so GDM and preeclampsia. Just a very quick cheeky plug before. So I'm actually part of a scheme called Health Pioneers, and it's a program created, and Mentorship to Health is a program by the charity, and it's basically to support state school students in Northeast London who want to pursue medicine or dentistry or any other healthcare related careers. So just a quick plug to sign up as a mentor if you guys would be interested. And essentially it's just supporting the student with their university application, things like personal statements, mock interviews, especially because these students do not have as much support from their schools itself. And it's really great for them to have a mentor who's already in university, sort of like support them through the process. So I did, I did it over the past year and it was really rewarding. So yeah, if you guys are interested, um, the deadline is the end of April, so I would love to have you guys sign up to the scheme if you'd like. So yeah, just a quick plug for that. Um, okay, so we'll start off with stages of labor. So as you guys know, there are three stages. So the first thing we have is the dilatation of the cervix, and it dilates up to 10 centimeters. And that's sort of like the end of stage one. Stage two is when you have these uterine contractions that increase in strength up to the delivery of the baby. And then stage three is where you've got your placenta that's expelled. And essentially just a few words that you probably hear thrown around. So dilatation we've mentioned already. So it's from closed to fully dilated, which is 10 centimeters. You have effacement, which is a thinning and shortening of the cervix. And it happens before you start to dilate. Um, and then station is basically the position of the baby's presenting part. So the head or the buttocks of its breech in relation to the pelvis. Do you guys know which part they use to assess station? The ischial spines, exactly. Um, someone has asked if we'll receive, receive the slides. Yes, so you guys will be receiving the slides at the end once you fill out the feed. I think they usually send it out after you fill out the feedback form. But yeah, so don't worry about like taking notes and stuff. You guys will have um, access to the slides. Um, so yeah, so station, as you guys said, so it's in relation to the ischial spine. That's something that you can feel on a vaginal examination. And just to quick, just quickly going through true labor as opposed to Braxton Hicks contractions. So true labor, are pain, it's painful contractions and it happens at regular intervals. That's how you define true labor. And it increases in intensity and duration. Sometimes you have sort of like a, a, sh a show or a cervical plug that you might see that basically passes and you might have you you then have effacement dilatation of the cervix and then you sort of have the yeah so you, you have the effacement dilatation and then you have these painful regular contractions as opposed to braxton hick which might be irregular and it might not be as painful as true labor contractions so in stage one, you've got your active phase and your latent phase. So stage one, the uterus contracts every two to three minutes. Latent phase is basically where you've got that effacement that I mentioned and then dilatation up to three to four centimeters. Active phase is where you've got full dilatation up to 10 centimeters. And in a nulliparous woman, so someone who's never given birth before, you'd expect them to progress at two centimeters every four hours. And that's sort of only for nulliparous because if someone is a multip, it's sort of a bit more variable as to their progress. So it's a bit more difficult to define failure to progress as someone has given birth before because they might be quite slow early on and they might catch up in stage two and stage three. So this is mainly for nulliparous women, the two centimeters every four hours. Stage two is from full dilatation to delivery of the fetus and you've got passive and active. So passive is in the absence of pushing. Active second stage is when the head reaches the pelvic floor and the mom gets the urge to push. And then stage three, we've already mentioned, is until delivery of the placenta. So usually women are defined as low risk and high risk. And if they are low risk, then they, they usually, usually just have intermittent auscultation by the midwife in a segment with free led care, as opposed to women that are high risk. And these women usually have continuous CTG monitoring. 
and monitoring during labor. So every 30 minutes, if it's intermittent, so you will do CTG, you'll monitor contractions, you'll monitor maternal pulse. And every four hours, you do things like checking for maternal temperature, blood pressure, urine. You do a VE as well, so a vaginal examination to assess progress. And you can basically have a partogram which has all of these observations so you can monitor it over time. Okay, so we'll go through preterm labor now. Do you guys know some of the things that can increase your risk of having preterm labor? Infections, yes, very good. Uh, Preeclampsia, previous preterm labor, infection, good. Smoking, I'm not too sure. I think, oh yeah, I think it can possibly. I haven't mentioned it in my list, but yeah. Um, yeah, I was actually looking for, yeah, short cervix. So any kind of procedures on your cervix, good. Uh, multiple births, not too sure. Multiple pregnancies, yes. So any kind of infection, chorioaminitis, good. So yeah, so we've mentioned infection already, multiple pregnancy, yes. Antipartum hemorrhage as well can precipitate labor a bit earlier. IUGR, so growth restriction, which could be secondary to preeclampsia. Polyhydramnios. So someone has said anhydramnios, which I'm not too sure about. I know polyhydramnios, but I'm not sure about anhydramnios, to be honest. That's something you'd have to check up. And then I've mentioned previous surgery as well can increase the risk of preterm labor. So do you guys know what this is? It's something that you can put in prophylactically or um, as a rescue procedure. Yes, a, a cervical cyclage. Yes, exactly. Good. So um, essentially, with I sorry, I've, I've written it down because I always forget the exactly when you can put it. Let me just check. Um, yeah. So essentially, you can offer a prophylactic cyclage until twenty three weeks, and you can give them a rescue cyclage anywhere between 16 to 27 weeks. And a rescue cyclage is put in if someone comes in with a dilated cervix and they've got exposed membranes that haven't ruptured yet. So if they're unruptured, then you can basically put this stitch in as a rescue procedure anywhere up until 27 weeks. And again, you can put in a prophylactic cyclage as well. And what they basically do is they measure the cervical length by, by doing a TVUS scan. Do you guys know what else they can give to people that are at increased risk of preterm labor? So there was like a prophylactic medication almost. A posturing suture, yes, it's the same thing as a posturing suture. So steroids is more if you're expecting them to deliver. So that's when you'd sort of give it for the fetal lung maturation. Uh, tocolytics, not so much. I was thinking more progesterone. So yeah, so you can give them progesterone actually as a prophylactic thing. So tocolytics and stuff is sort of like if labor's already happened and then you want to stop it. Whereas as a prophylactic thing, yes, you can give them vaginal progesterone. And essentially you start it between 16 and 24 weeks and you can continue it until at least 34 weeks. Um, yeah, and then all of that, the cerclage, the vaginal progesterone is all dependent on the cervical length, which they do on the transvaginal scan, as I mentioned. Yeah, so those are the two things that you can do prophylactically. And essentially with preterm labor, you've got multiple risks of prematurity in the baby. So things like neck, so necrotizing enterocolitis, which you can see in premature babies. You can see neonatal jaundice, failure to thrive, cerebral palsy, and respiratory distress syndrome as well. Okay, so an MCQ about someone that comes in with preterm, pre-labor rupture of membranes. I'll let you guys um, sort of read through that. And if we can have the polling as well for the question, that would be great. Thank you. So you've got someone with a history of clear vaginal loss who is 18 weeks pregnant.
Okay, so if we can um, show the answers. Yeah, okay. So most of you guys said C, which is what I said initially, actually. And the, the, the answer is actually D. Does someone know why it's D over C? And then we'll go through the other options because that's what most of you guys picked. Any ideas why? So the only difference really between D and C. So in both cases, you're actually admitting them. The only difference is that D says you wouldn't give steroids, whereas C says you would give steroids. So what do we think about that? Do we give this lady steroids? Too, too, I think you mean too early for steroids. Yes, yes, exactly. So actually she is only 18 weeks pregnant, whereas most, I mean, I had a look to see exactly what the, so from what I had, from what I saw, it's anywhere between 24 weeks. I think usually people are not too comfortable giving women steroids under 24 weeks. And that's why the answer is D. So do you know why you wouldn't discharge this lady? So why is it not A? Let's go through the other options. What is the risk with um, sending her home? Miscarriage, true. Anything else that we might be worried about? Infection. Yeah, so that's, a, well, that's one of the big things that we're worried about because she's, she's had clear vaginal loss. She's at an increased risk of actually ascending infections. So we really want to admit her. We want to do infection markers because even though she might not be septic right now, she could become septic very quickly. Good. That's why you don't want to discharge her just yet. I mean, it's not going to be B because we don't know that it's she's definitely going to miscarry. Yes, she's at increased risk. And also, I mean, she's 18 weeks, so it's quite early to have a prom, to, to, to have a preterm, pre-labor rupture of membranes. So, I mean, the prognosis doesn't look good, but you wouldn't offer her termination straight away. I don't think that would be appropriate. So we've said already why C, so C and D are the ones that are the most appropriate because E is incorrect again. You really want to admit her. Um, so the only difference between C and D is that you would not give steroids because she's too early on in her pregnancy. But yeah, you want to do an ultrasound scan. Why would we do an ultrasound scan in this lady? What, what would we be looking for on the ultrasound scan? Check for viability. Yes, very good point. Anything else we would look for? Anything else we can assess on an ultrasound scan? Fetal distress, you wouldn't really be able to see. That would be more on a CTG. Um, placenta previa, good lie of the fetus, amniotic fluid volume, exactly. That's sort of like what I was looking for. Good. So that's essentially, if, if someone has had clear vaginal loss and you would have decreased lycor surrounding the baby, so that's something that you would look for. Good. So yeah, this is, so we're just going to quickly go through preterm, pre-labor rupture of membranes or P-PROM. So what is it? So it's defined as rupture of membranes between 24 and 37 weeks. And this lady had actually happened before that. Um, in the absence of uterine activity. So it's pre-labor. And why is it a problem? Because of the risk of infection we've mentioned already and the risk of prematurity in the neonate. And how do we investigate it? So you wanna do your FPC, CRP. You wanna confirm the rupture of membranes. And you can either do that on speculum because you might see you know, clear fluid draining. Um, you wouldn't be able to see the sac. Um, or you might see, you, you can also do a fetal fibronectin as well, which is sort of like a point of care test. And it basically predicts the risk of premature birth. And how do we treat it? So we can, we basically give um, antibiotics for 10 days. You consider steroids if they're, you know, post 24 weeks. So yeah, so you'd admit these women, you'd, you'd observe them, you do all of your infection screening. And then, you know, if, 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 they're, if they're fine after a period of observation, the fetal fibronectin is low, so the risk of premature birth is quite low, then you can send them home and you might bring them back in like a week's time or so to like the maternity assessment unit. But it's very much dependent on, you know, um, how their infection markers are, if they're fine, if they're stable on observations, if they're happy to go home. Because you don't really want to, there's no point in keeping someone who's 25 weeks so you just send them home and then just safety net them very carefully to come in if they have any signs of labor. And you'd send them home once on antibiotics to cover them for any infection. Okay, does anyone have any questions with that? Yeah, so it's it's just, just, just remember that it's at, you know, these women are at an increased risk of infection, so we give them erythromycin for 10 days. Okay, so moving on to active management of labor what would be the most appropriate management plan for this lady?
Okay. So most of you guys picked E, which is actually the correct answer. So why would we not re-examine in four hours? Why did, because she's progressing, exactly. So um, when after, even after 72 hours, her cervix is five centimeters dilated and four hours later, she's still not progressed. And she is a null, she's a null lip. So you would expect, so you want her to progress, you know, at least two centimeters every four hours. So she's definitely, she, she's basically failure to progress. So yeah, so you wouldn't re-examine her again in four hours. She needs act, something done. She needs some active intervention, essentially active management. So why is it not B? Why wouldn't you go straight for cesarean section? Yeah, so there's no sort of um, indication to you know, deliver the fetus imminently. You know, it doesn't say that the CTG shows late decelerations, bradycardia, any of those things where you have to, you know, in intervene immediately. And also, you know, you want to give everyone the maximum chance of a vaginal delivery because it has fewer risks than a cesarean section. So, you know, you definitely want to give her the option of a vaginal delivery, definitely. Um, so why is it not C? Because C and E are quite similar. So, you know, starting an oxytocin infusion, intermittent monitoring and reassessing. Yeah, four hours is too long. That's true. Anything else? Yes. So actually, it's a thing about continuous monitoring because oxytocin, you have a risk of hyperstimulation of the uterus because you're giving something to induce the contractions. So yeah, so that's why you do, you do, you wouldn't really do intermittent monitoring. So if women from like the midwifery, let's sweet, if you're giving them an oxytocin infusion and you have, they have to be moved over to labor because then it becomes sort of like a high risk labor just because of that increased risks of in, induction itself. So yeah, so you have to commence continuous monitoring which is why you wouldn't do C. And why would we not do D? Why wouldn't we give, give her another uh, prostaglandin? Because she's had four milligrams already. Why wouldn't we give her give her another one? Um, so the reason why you wouldn't give another prostaglandin is because the cervix is sort of already dilated. So what the prostaglandin does is it prepares the cervix. So it causes the, the effacement of the cervix. It causes the dilatation. The cervix has already started to dilate. Whereas what she needs now is the oxytocin, which will sort of help that. So that's why they say you wouldn't really give another one. And there is a maximum dose, you're right. There is a maximum dose of prostaglandins that you can give. I'm not sure exactly what it is and sort of varies between trusts, but because you've already given the prostaglandin and she has dilated after the prostaglandin, what you would try next is an oxytocin infusion. So the answer is E in this case. When would you consider artificial rupture of membranes? I think if they are you know, dilated, if they are progressing, if they're getting these regular contractions, but they still haven't ruptured their membranes and you might trial rupture of membranes because what, what can happen is by rupturing the membranes that can trigger labor. So you might consider doing that. There isn't like a specific time. A lot of it's just, you know, dependent on, uh, on the obstetrician itself. So there isn't a specific time where you might consider it. But yeah, so if, yeah, if, if they're progressing really well, but they haven't started regular contractions yet, then you can try a trial of ARM. But you definitely, you need to be able to, you know, you need to be able to see the bulging membranes to be able to, so it's a lot of it is like whether you'd be able to practically do the ARM procedure, which is artificial rupture of membranes. Okay, so quickly go into induction of labor. So why do we induce? It's basically where risks of continuing with the pregnancy is greater than the risk of delivery for the mother and for the fetus. And some obstetric indications are things like IUGR, prolonged pregnancy, which is in this case, um, non-reassuring CTG, severe preeclampsia. If you've got obstetric cholestasis as well, because of the risk of stillbirth with OC, you might decide to induce at an earlier date. 
Um, and then medical reasons as well. So if they are, if they are GDM on instant or they're poorly controlled, often these women might get induction of labor. Um, and you basically use Bishop's score. And that's something that's done to assess favorability, to basically decide how favorable the cervix is to have a greater success at induction, essentially. And how do we do it? So we've mentioned already some of the methods. So often women, if women are over 41 weeks, if they're multiparous, so over 40 weeks if they're nulliparous, and they're offered a membrane sweep, and essentially it is, it's what it basically says. You basically go in and you basically try to sweep the membranes and that essentially tries to separate it. And that should hopefully trigger labor. You can give prostaglandins as well. And they basically cause the cervical effacement and then they cause the uterine contractions. And um, at Newham anyway, they basically usually put a pessary and then they would give women the prostin gel. So there's a pessary that lasts for 24 hours and then you can give them the gel as well on top of that. So there's usually a maximum dose of prostaglandins that you can give. And then we mentioned the oxytocin infusion, and you can also do an amniotomy, which is basically where you use a little hook, and that's what it shows in that picture. So as you can see, you should be able to get good access, and you should be able to see the membranes in order to rupture it. So those are the different methods. Do you guys know what sort of things make up Bishop's score when we're assessing favorability? Yeah, cervical so position, station, good. Anything else that we would consider? Dilatation, yes, definitely. Cervical effacement, engagement. Yeah, I think you guys have mentioned most of it because you've said consistency. So yeah, so position, you guys don't need to remember the actual sort of like the scores and how you would score it because that's way beyond what we would need to know. So, but you need to know what different components make up the uh, Bishop score and that a total score of over eight indicates a favorable cervix. So yes, yeah, so you guys have mentioned position, length, consistency, dilatation, and station of the presenting part. So it's five different components that make up the Bishop score. And there's things to consider when inducing labor. So it's really important for CTG monitoring. We've mentioned continuous CTG monitoring for women who are on oxytocin infusion. You need to monitor you for uterine contractions as well. Assess Bishop score before starting induction. And you want to check the umbilical cord during VE exam because you want to rule out, for, you rule out a cord prolapse, which we're going to come on to in a bit. And then you want to check previous scans as well for a low-lying placenta because you wouldn't induce someone if they've got a low-lying placenta. Women should be informed that IOL is likely, or IOL or induction of labor, is likely to be more painful than spontaneous labor. And they're often offered pain relief, so epidural. I think someone mentioned if you can have an epidural with an oxytocin infusion. Yeah, you definitely can. And women are often um, given um, the option for epidural because it is likely to be more painful, as I said. And need to assess progress. So when you, when you put the pessary in, the pessary is a bit like a tampon so that it just sits in, it sits in for 24 hours. So you wanna assess them 24 hours after the pessary or six hours after the gel. Um, and complications we've mentioned already. So you can get uterine hyperstimulation. If that does happen, then you can basically just reduce the rate of the oxytocin infusion. You can sometimes give tocolytic agents as well. Um, and again, a very rare complication, but it can happen. You can get uterine rupture as well. And then you can, get, you can have failure of induction. So when that does happen, it's very much a senior led decision. They might either repeat the induction process or they might offer the woman a cesarean section. Those are the main complications that you can get with induction of labor. And I think that's just uh, trying to show you hyperstimulation. And with the you try and hyperstimulation, you would sort of get like fetal distress as well um, associated with it. Okay, now we're going to move on to breach presentation now. So we'll do a MCQ before we discuss breach. So you've got someone who is offered an ECV. Which of these is not an absolute contraindication to having an ECV procedure?
Okay, so if we can show the uh, the poll results, yeah, great, thank you. Um, okay, so most of you guys said E, um, few of you guys said D and A. Okay, so the correct answer is E. Have I put the answer? Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So the correct answer is E. And basically the things that I think of with ECV, the way to think about contraindications for that is for the procedure to be successful. So ECV is basically where essentially you're using external force to turn the baby around to cephalic. And what you need for ECV to be successful is there needs to be enough space, there needs to be enough fluid as well for the baby to basically turn around. So with multiple pregnancy, the thing is there's not gonna be enough space and you're less likely to be successful um, just because yeah, there's, there's less space for the babies to basically turn around. With a major uterine abnormality, which is a risk factor for breech presentation. So if you've got by major uterine abnormality, they mean things like a biconduit uterus where you've got two uterine horns, for example. Again, there's less space, so they're less likely to, to be successful. Um, so that, again, that's why you wouldn't do it with a major uterine abnormality. Antipartum hemorrhage within the last seven days is definitely an absolute contraindication because it increases your risk of having a placental abruption if you do an ECV in these women. Rupture of membranes, again, there's not, often these women will have very, very, very little fluid because they'd have, they would have a history of fluid leaking. So again, it would not be successful. That's again, another contraindication. Whereas small for gestational age with abnormal Doppler scan is not necessarily an absolute contraindication. So yeah, so the answer is E in this case. So in all of these other options, you wouldn't really offer them an external cephalic version. And do you guys know when we would offer it for nulliparous and when we would offer it for multiparous women? So someone has asked, how long do you wait after giving PGE to administer oxytocin? Zoom PG hasn't done anything. So I think that's very much dependent on your, um, you know, on your labor ward protocol. Um, I think it depends, I think you would, so you'd usually assess six hours after. And essentially, if they haven't progressed, then I think you would basically, you because if you have reached the maximum dose of prostaglandins that you've given, and they haven't progressed after six hours, I think you would then start them on oxytocin, from what I remember. Because so that's when you'd assess progress, six hours after giving the prostaglandins. That makes sense. Um, yes, 37 weeks of multiple 36 of nulliparis. That sounds right. I've got the answer on the next page. I always get confused which way around it is, but that sounds about right. I think it's, you, give it, you give it earlier, so 36 if it's nulliparis, 37 if it's multiple. That sounds right. We'll check in the next slide. So breach, breach presentation, you've got three different types. You've got frank breach, complete breach, and footling breach. One of them is a lot more common. Footling is the least common. I can't remember which of these is more common. Um, yeah, there's definitely one of them is more common than the other. Um, so it's basically when the buttocks, the foot or feet are presenting instead of the head in longitudinal life. Um, and actually the thing to remember is it's normal in under 37 weeks. Basically, what is, so what are some of the risk factors? We've mentioned one already. So having a major uterine abnormality. So things like a biconeal uterus is a risk factor. Anything else? Any other risk factors for a breech presentation? Polyhydramnios, yeah. So there's just more space. The way I remember there's just more space for them to like swim around. Yes, definitely. That's one of them. Anything else? Presenter previa, yes. Um, and the way I remember that one is the placenta is just in the way. So the head is not able to actually engage. So yeah, good. That's another one. Multiple pregnancy, definitely. Um, fibroids, yes, that can be another one. So any kind of any problems of the uterus, good. So I've divided it up into uterine and fetal. So uterine or multiparity, malformation, so septate uterus. But septate uterus is just where you've got like a film so like in between, whereas biconduit is where you've got two separate horns of the uterus. It sort of looks like a heart-shaped uterus, which is, um, yeah, and that's why you can get the breech presentation. So you, fibroids, we've mentioned placenta previa, good, and fetal risk factors are prematurity, macrosomia, polyhydramnios, any kind of congenital abnormality as well. I don't know exactly why, but that's one, that, that increases your risk of breech presentation. And how do we manage this? So we've mentioned giving women the chance of, I mean, women have the right to say no to an ECV because actually it's got a 50% success rate. So some women just decline an ECV, which is absolutely fine. So you can have an ECV. So yes, you're right. It's 36 weeks for nulliparis, 37 for multi. That's usually when we offer it. And yeah, it's got a 50% success rate. And if it's failed, then they can have an elective cesarean section at around 39 weeks. Um, you can do a vaginal breach delivery as well. With women, but often I've seen women get elective or get offered an elective C-section. Um, yeah, usually around thirty-nine weeks. So yeah, so 
So you've got three different types of breach presentation. The risk factors can be uterine or fetal, and you offer them an ECV. If that doesn't work, then you can give either vaginal breach delivery or an elective C-section. You'd, you'd obviously counsel the woman really well about the risks of both. Okay, now moving on to, okay, to another complication in labor. So you're a junior doctor in the labor ward. You're called by a midwife to a delivery in which a baby's head has been delivered, but the shoulders are not delivering. Which of these is your first step in the management of this condition? So remember first step. And also the fact that you're a junior doctor in the labor ward. So you probably would not do a cesarean section. <laughs> Okay, so if we can um, show the poll answers. Okay, so 90% of you guys said D, which is the right answer. Um, yeah, do you guys know what the name of this maneuver is? When you ask the mom to hyperflex her legs. There are so many different names. I was just to get confused. But yeah, what's the name for this maneuver? McRoberts, exactly. Good. Um, so yeah, that's the answer for this question. Um, and we'll go through shoulder dystocia. What is the biggest risk factor for shoulder dystocia? Um, so that's a complication. Yes, I was going to ask you guys that. Yes, so Herb's palsy is a complication that you can get from shoulder dystocia. Yes, GDM is one of the biggest risk factors. And the reason why is that uh, babies at GDM, they often have a lot of fat on their shoulders, which is why they sort of like get stuck. So it's not about just like overall fat. It's just about like the... The, the sort of like the, I guess the diameter essentially. And that's where it's just like, it gets stuck. Um, yeah, and you can, you, you basically see that a lot more with with um, with GDM babies, good. Um, so yeah, so you've got the presentation of the head and essentially you've got rotation and delivery of the anterior shoulder. And it's usually on delivery of the anterior shoulder, which is where it gets stuck. And, and it usually gets stuck behind the maternal pubic symphysis. And we mentioned the biggest risk factor is macrosomia, particularly in women with GDM. So maternal complications of shoulder dystocia are PPH. You can get third and fourth degree tears as well. And fetal complications. We've mentioned Herb's palsy. So what exactly is that an injury of? Oh, you guys have mentioned already. Yeah, so it's a brachial plexus injury. And essentially it's because the shoulder gets stuck, you've got an injury of the brachial plexus and that gives you Herb's palsy, which is the, your uh, way to tip sign. Um, and you can get fetal hypoxia. You can get fractures as well, the clavicle and the humerus, which can happen from delivery. And you can get fetal hypoxia as well. So, yeah, so you've got that weighted tip deformity of the wrist. Um, you can get things like Horner syndrome, bird winging of the scapula. So all of those things you can get as presentation of Herb's palsy. So this is basically McRoberts maneuver. So you definitely call for help because it's an emergency. You'd ask the mom to stop pushing. And you consider an episiotomy because it can make maneuvers easier. But the thing that you want to do is McRoberts position, McRoberts maneuver, sorry. So it's knees to chest or hyperflexing the legs. And basically what it does is it widens the, out, the pelvic outlet because it's a bony problem because the, the baby's anterior shoulder gets stuck behind the pubic symphysis. So actually hyperflexing the leg, legs increases the outlet. So it gives you more space. Um, and if you combine that with suprapubic pressure, which is what this diagram shows, it basically has a success rate of 90%. But you can also do um, lots of like weird and wonderful maneuvers. Like there's like a wood screw maneuver. There's lots of other things as well that, we, that you can do. The thing that you guys need to know is what's the first line. And the first line is, you know, call for help, asking the mom to stop pushing and then McRoberts maneuver because it has quite a high success rate. So another complication that you might see during labor. So you've got an umbilical cord visibly protruding from the vagina. What is the correct position for this woman to be in while being prepared for surgery?
Okay, so most of you guys said the right answer, which is D. So you want her on her knees and elbows, essentially. And the reason why we do that is someone's mentioned in the chat already. So it's basically you want to relieve pressure on the cord, and um, as, as, like to to avoid any of the you know the, the resulting fetal hypoxia. So you want to minimize that. So essentially, the treatment for that is emergency C-section. But whilst she's being transferred, you want her on her knees and elbows. So what exact what is this complication called when you can see the umbilical cord visibly protruding? Cord prolapse, exactly. Good. So cord prolapse is when it descends through the cervix and the umbilical cord is, is seen on or before the presenting part. And why is it a problem? So it's got a very high mortality rate, usually linked to the risk factors. So you've got fetal hypoxia because the cord can get compressed, that's occlusion, but you can also get arterial vasospasm as well, because what happens in the cord is exposed to the cold atmosphere is you can get that vasospasm, which again contributes to the fetal hypoxia. Some of the risk factors, so breach presentation actually is, an, is a risk factor for cord prolapse, unstable lies. So if in someone over 37 weeks, if, if the position of the fetus keeps changing, that's what we classify as unstable lie. So you basically consider an inpatient admission for these patients, at least until delivery, because of the risk of cord prolapse. So if you do an ARM and the presenting part is quite high in the pelvis, what can happen is because you've got a sudden loss of pressure, the umbilical cord can sort of like come down and that, that can result in cord prolapse. So an ARM with a high presenting part is a risk factor for cord prolapse. And polyhydramnios as well is another risk factor. And prematurity. So when it comes to management of cord prolapse, so when would you consider it? You'd consider it if you've got, you don't, you have absent membranes and you've got basically a pathological CTG. So, you know, things like late decelerations, fetal bradycardia, non-reassuring fetal heart rate trace, basically. And it can be confirmed on external inspection or if you can do a VE and you can feel the cord protruding before the presenting part. And fetal heart rate patterns, yes. So I've mentioned the decelerations, you might see fetal bradycardia, and fetal bradycardia is more strongly associated with prolapse because of the cord occlusion. So I can give you these sudden episodes of fetal bradycardia. And yeah, call for help, it's an emergency. You want to avoid handling the cord because that, that um, you want to reduce vasospasm caused by handling the cord. You want to manually elevate the presenting part of the cord during vaginal examination. Uh, position, so basically you can do knee to chest or left lateral and both of these positions essentially relieve the pressure of the cord. And you can consider tocolysis, but usually these women just need delivery via an emergency C-section. And this is something that you don't really do in hospital. It's more sort of like in the community whilst they're being transferred into hospital. So you basically put a, a urinary catheter in and you inflate it with some, you know, with some IV fluid. And essentially what happens is you've got an enlarged bladder. So the fetal head is sort of like pushed away from the cord because of the enlarged bladder. So you can do that in the community whilst you're um, arranging for transfer. But the two main positions that you can do is the exaggerated SIMS position, or you can put them on the left lateral position as well. Okay, so when it comes to instrumental deliveries, there's two main instruments that you can use. You can use the Kiwi or the Vontus, or you can use forceps delivery. And forceps basically, in general, they've got lower fetal complications, but greater maternal complications. And we'll go through what some of them are. And the general rule of thumb is they do three contractions and pulls. So you do a pull sort of like with each contraction. And if after three tries, there's no reasonable progress, then the attempt is basically abandoned. That's sort of like the general rule of thumb that they do with instrumental deliveries. With the Kiwi or a Vontus, it's basically a handheld disposable device. It can be used for all fetal positions and it's rotational. Uh, maternal risks is lower. It's better for the mom because it's lower pain and perineal injury. Do you guys know what some of the risks are to the baby from like a Vontus or a Kiwi delivery? Yes, kephal hematoma, good. Yeah, so because of the pressure, basically you can get um, yeah, there's a higher risk of retinal hemorrhage, higher risk of kephal hematoma. Good. So I used to always get confused between the kephal hematoma, kaput succedaneum, and this other one as well. So this is a really good like picture actually it shows you the difference. The thing that I still remember is kaput succedaneum, however you say that, it CS, so it crosses suture lines. That's just what I learned from Pathmed and I still remember it. 
And yeah, that's the thing that you need to remember about kaput succedinium as opposed to kephal hematoma because kephal hematoma is usually over the parietal bones, doesn't actually cross your suture lines. And um, uh, kaput succedinium, it resolves within 48 to 72 hours, whereas a kephal hematoma usually lasts two to three weeks. So those are, those are just the diff three different ones, a bit more peds related, but something that's, um, you know, if you have a kiwi delivery, you're at increased risk of getting this. And then moving on to forceps delivery. So you've got different types of forceps. You've got the non-rotational ones. So if the baby is occipital anterior, so occipital is the back of the head, so that's facing up, then you can use a non-rotational forceps. If um, at a C-section, sometimes you can use Wrigley's, or it's basically like, it's sort of like a low, I don't know what the other name is, but yeah, you can basically, you most commonly use it at C-section. It, it's also called like an outlet forceps. So if the baby is right at the outer, then you can use Wrigley's, but that's not usually used. It's more commonly used at C-sections. If you need to rotate the position of the baby, then you can use Keelan's forceps. So you've got non-rotational and rotational forceps. And with forceps, as I mentioned, there's a higher rate of third and fourth degree tears. So it's really important when you insert the blades to actually protect the perineum to decrease the risk of any tears. So there are a few prerequisites that you need to meet before you have an instrumental delivery. So the way to remember is there's a mnemonic called forceps. So you need to have a fully dilated cervix and obstruction needs to be excluded. So that's basically when they have a look and they look for things like kaput and molding. And that's basically, they look at, they look at the suture lines in the baby's head to see if there's any signs of obstruction. Um, and then they look, you need to have ruptured your membranes before you can have forceps delivery, you need to consent them, catheterize the bladder, check instruments. Um, you need to have adequate you know, pain relief. So usually these women have epidural anesthesia. Um, you need to check for the presentation and position of the fetal head and then station of the presenting part as well and senior help if needed. So yeah, so the main things are, you know, they need to be fully dilated, ruptured membranes, analgesia and presentation is really important as well. So maternal indications for a, instrumental delivery or if you've had a prolonged second stage. So you usually allow two hours of active pushing in a nulliparous woman and one hour in a multiparous. That's what you usually allow. Again, maternal exhaustion is, is um, you know, it's a good enough indication for an instrumental delivery. If the mom has maternal medical conditions, so things like severe hypertension, any kind of intracranial pathology where you don't want the mom to be pushing for a really long period of time, then you would give them instrumental delivery. Um, fetal indications are, you know, if they've got any kind of fetal compromise in the second stage of labor. So that could be seen by CTG or fetal blood sampling as well. They don't do fetal blood sampling as much anymore, but sometimes if they do do it and, um, you know, it shows suspected fetal compromise, then you might um, go for an instrumental delivery. Okay, so now that you guys know all of the indications um, for a instrumental delivery, what would you guys do for this lady? She's Nulla Paris, 37 weeks gestation, cervix is seven centimeters, head is OA, and the fetal station is minus one. And you've got some CTG changes. So most of you guys said A, which is go for a cesarean section. So why did you guys say cesarean section over um, von to delivery or non-rotational forceps? Yeah, so distress and they're only seven centimeters exactly. Baby needs to come out ASAP and the head's not engaged as well. Yes, definitely. So I would say this woman needs an emergency cesarean section. And the things that, you know, there's fetal bradycardia, there's late decelerations, and this is continuing for 15 minutes, which is really worrying. 
infect yet. She needs a cesarean section. Okay, so what would you do for this lady? So you've got 29 year old multiparis, four centimeters dilated. She then gets sudden onset, severe continuous lower abdominal pain. Um, so yeah, so most of you guys said D, which is, yeah, this lady would also worn an immediate cesarean section, which is the correct answer. So FPS, sorry, someone's asked, FPS is fetal blood sampling. I'm um, sorry, I should have clarified what that was. Um, sorry, what was the answer to the last MCQ? Yeah, I'll just go back to that after this one, no problem. So yeah, so the answer is immediate cesarean section in this lady. What do we think has happened? What complication of labor has this lady had? And what is her risk factor for that complication? Yeah, mentioned that already. Um, placental rupture, she could have had a placental rupture, yes. Um, you try and rupture slightly more likely because she's got this sudden onset, severe continuous lower abdominal pain. But yeah, I agree, it could be placental abruption as well. That's a very, it's like an important differential to think about. So yeah, so the thing that I was thinking about with this was uterine rupture, exactly. Um, and what is her risk factor actually for her having a uterine rupture? So yeah, hyperstimulation, but there's no history of her having any kind of induction of labor. Previous section, so yeah, so we don't actually know if she's had any previous section, but we do know that she's multiparous. So that itself is an increased risk of uterine rupture. Good, that's what I was getting at with this question. Um, someone has asked for the answer to the previous one. So it was cesarean section for this lady as well. I promise not all the answers to your obstetric questions are cesarean section, but just these two ended up being emergency cesarean section. Um, okay, so yeah, so uterine rupture. So it's basically a full thickness tear of the uterine. Muscle typically occurs during labor. Um, it's rare, but it does have significant maternal and fetal risks. And risk factors is basically anything that makes the uterus weaker. So pre previous cesarean section, having a myomectomy. So that's your procedure that you can do for fibroids that are quite troublesome, especially in women that want to preserve their fertility. You can do a myomectomy, which is just where you remove the fibroids itself. Um, and then induction of labor, we mentioned that multiple pregnancy. So yeah, this lady was multiple, so that increases her risk. Um, oh, sorry, multiparity, multiple pregnancy as well. Um, and what are some of the signs? So sudden severe abdominal pain it persists between contractions. You might get some shoulder tip pain as well because of the um, because of the hemoperitoneum, sorry. Um, you can get vaginal bleeding and on examination, this is some of the things that they just the textbooks mentioned. So you can get scar tenderness, you might get palpable fetal parts, regression of the presenting part. So all of these things you might see in your, in your exam questions or on examination. And on their observations, they'd be hypovolemic, they'd be tachycardic, and then fetal monitoring, they'd definitely be in just the fetal fetus would be in distress. So yeah, so it's quite a sudden, you know, as severe as the word you try and rupture sound. So it's sudden, severe onset pain, all any any risk factors, anything that basically makes the uterus weaker. And you want to send these women straight for emergency cesarean section. So yeah, so management A to E approach, um, uh, EMCS is emergency cesarean section. Okay, so episiotomy. So they don't really do the midline episiotomy anymore. They always do the medial lateral one. Um, so it's a surgically planned incision 
on the perineum and the posterior vaginal wall during the second stage of labor? When would they consider an episiotomy? So if there's a high likelihood of you know, severe laceration. So it's just creating a bit more space and it's an anticipation. So if you don't create that space, you're more likely to get more severe trauma. And if you've got a compromised fetus and you wanna accelerate delivery, then you might consider an episiotomy if you're doing an instrumental delivery. Complications are it can extend to involve the rectum. Unfortunately, you can get a vulval hematoma, infection, and dyspareunia, which is pain during sexual intercourse. That's one of the chronic complications. It's not seen in all women, but some women can get that. And then injury to the anal sphincter can leave you with incontinence. Um, when it comes to perineal tears, you've got four degrees of perineal tears. Um, and first and second degree are quite uncomplicated. You can just suture them under local anesthetic. Whereas, and you need to always do a PR exam because you want to assess for any damage to the anal sphincter. So that's really important with perineal tears. And just something to like outpatient management. So you wanna refer any third and fourth degree tears for physio because these patients are at increased risk of incontinence later on. So it's really important for them to do uh, pelvic exercises and things after they've healed from the tear. So you'd refer these patients for physio. Okay, so I'm going to move on to uh, diabetes and preeclampsia now. So we'll start off with an MCQ on um, gestational diabetes. So you've got someone, she's South Asian. She's had one previous delivery. Um, strong family history of type 2 diabetes. Her fasting glucose is 7.2. What's the most appropriate initial management given her fasting glucose level? It's a bit of a tricky one. Someone's asked, do you just anesthetize the area with lidocaine? Yeah, yeah, so you just give them local anesthetic. You can also give them pudendal nerve blocks as well, is what I've read. I've never seen that being done on the labor ward, but you can give them like a nerve block. A pudendal or a perineal nerve block you can give them. Yeah, usually it's just local anesthetic. Give you a couple more seconds. Okay, so if we can show the poll results. Yeah, so I expected it to be quite sort of split between them. So um, by a very, very small margin, a lot of people have picked D, which is the correct answer actually. So why did people pick, why did people go straight for insulin? The people that did pick insulin. Yes, yeah, which is really good that you guys picked up on that. Um, so the, the thing that I was trying to sort of uh, say with this is that the reason why you would go straight for insulin is because a fasting glucose is over seven. And if your fasting glucose is over seven, when, when, you know, when they do the screening, they'd basically go straight for, you'd give them insulin essentially. But you'd also obviously give them the advice on diet and exercise plus daily blood glucose monitoring. But the thing that this question is trying to say is that you start them on insulin basically. And glycoside is not something you'd give in pregnancy. Metformin is safe in pregnancy, yes. So we'll quickly go through gestational diabetes. Raise a few questions. So you've got a 34-year-old South Asian primep. Her BMI is 35, and she's come in for her antenatal booking appointment. What sort of questions would you ask her to determine her risk of GDM? Family history, past pregnancy, GDM, previous history, good. Um, anything else you'd ask for in her previous obstetric history? PCOS, yeah, that's a good point actually. Weight of the baby, yes, good. And that's another thing you'd ask for as well. And how would you screen for GDM? Sort of mentioned it briefly in the question, but what, what do we usually do? OGTT, yeah. Because HbA1c is not very reliable in pregnancy. So they usually do fasting glucose and then they give you an OGTT as well. Good. And when do we usually screen? Unless you've obviously had previous GDM, then you might screen earlier, but when is the standard screening done? It's actually not done at booking. Um, it's, yeah, it's only done 24 to 28 weeks, which I always find a bit weird because I think it's 
I mean, I don't know if it's too late to screen them and then start treatment, but yeah, that's usually the, the guidelines say 24 to 28 weeks, but there are some women that have it done earlier if they've had previous TDM and it's very high likely that they're gonna develop it again. Yeah, so essentially risk factors, BMI of over 30, you've mentioned family history, ethnicity as well. Um, so yeah, South Asian, Chinese, African, Caribbean, Middle East. You guys have mentioned previous GDM and previous macrosomic baby. And you define that as a birth weight of over 4.5 kilos. So screening and diagnosis we mentioned already. And just remember five, six, seven, eight. So fasting plasma glucose that OGTT was 8.5. So she's, she's diagnosed with GDM based on the criteria. What would you do next? So basically this woman would be offered an appointment in the diabetes antenatal clinic within a week's time. She'd be counseled on the complications of diabetes, you know, monitoring glucose, the importance of glycemic control. And your options are basically diet control, metformin and insulin because all of the other hypoglycemic agents are basically not safe in pregnancy. These are the ones that are safe in pregnancy. Um, so yeah, we mentioned this already. So if your fasting plasma glucose is under seven at diagnosis, you can give them a diet and exercise trial for one to two weeks. And then you can start them on metformin. If that doesn't work, you can then give them insulin. If the fasting plasma glucose, however, is over seven at diagnosis, like it was in that question, then you'd start them on insulin, plus or minus metformin, and then always give them the diet and exercise advice. If um, the fasting plasma glucose is 6.0 to 6.9, and they've already developed complications like macrosomia, polyhydramnios. Again, you'd err on the side of caution and you'd start off with insulin. So what are some of the complications of gestational diabetes for the mom? Can we think of any kind of complications? So when do we screen for high risk? There isn't a specific time. All I know that they usually get screened a little bit earlier. I don't know about the exact time, unfortunately. Um, Preterm labor, hypoglycemia, risk of developing diabetes in the future, good. Um, PP, I don't know that says PP. Stillbirth, preeclampsia, pre yes, that's, yeah, that's another important risk factor. Good, so increased risk of preeclampsia, increased risk of infections as well, and higher rates of induction of labor and cesarean section in these women, and higher rates of miscarriage as well. So what are some of the fetal complications? Shoulder dystocia, yeah. Your natal hypoglycemia, very good. That's very important, um, especially in the postnatal ward. Mid mid the midwives are you know, taught to check these babies' blood glucose regularly. Herbs palsy, if they've got shoulder dys um, dystocia, good. Um, anything else that you can get with regards to the fluid around the baby? Polyhydramnios, yes. And why do you get polyhydramnios with um, GDM? Yes, the baby's producing more urine, but why is the baby producing more urine? Yes, osmotic diuresis, exactly. So essentially the the, there's a lot of sugar that's basically going to the baby and the sugar basically has a direct diuretic effect and basically water just follows. Good. Um, so the other thing that people haven't mentioned is actually that these babies are at an increased risk of malformations. It's usually cardiac and um, central nervous system, which is why they might have some extra scans during their pregnancy. Um, macrosomia, we've mentioned already, shoulder dystocia, polyhydramnia, so you've said why that happens, preterm birth, you guys have mentioned stillbirth, and hypoglycemia after birth, which is really good. And also there's a slightly high, higher risk of diabetes and obesity in later life as well for the babies. So will I have any extra scans? Does it mean I have to have a cesarean section? Will I have diabetes for the rest of my life? So quickly going through extra scans during pregnancy. So we've mentioned already, these women will be seen by the diabetic clinic every one to two weeks. They have a detailed anomaly scan at 18 to 20 weeks. And it's really important to have a four chamber heart view at the anomaly scan, just to be confident that they don't have any cardiac defects. And they basically have growth scans every four weeks. And because these babies are at risk of macrosomia, they basically monitor their abdominal circumference. That's what AC is. That's just a marker that they look for on the scan. And they do these scans every four weeks to check the growth. And self-monitoring is really important. So these women are taught uh, to monitor their um, sugar levels fasting and one hour post the meal. 
And delivery and labor. So women with GDM are advised to give birth by 40 plus six weeks because there's an increased risk of stillbirth after this. And um, if they're not given birth by this time, you offer elective birth by induction or cesarean section. If they've got any maternal fetal complications, you deliver before. But there's no complications, you can deliver by 40 plus six weeks. So we've already mentioned why you'd give corticosteroids a few times before. So it's for fetal lung maturity. What is the risk of giving corticosteroids in someone with uh, pre-existing diabetes or GDM? What should we really closely monitor if you're giving someone corticosteroids? BMs, perfect, good. That's just uh, something to remember with corticosteroids. And during labor, um, if someone's on insulin, you wanna consider sliding scale. Um, you wanna give them continuous CTG monitoring. And so these, so these women would be high risk. Um, they wouldn't really deliver on like a midwifery led suite. Um, requirements, and it's an important thing to remember is women's insulin requirements decrease post-delivery. And that's something to just think about for um, women that are on pre-existing insulin. So you'd increase the insulin during pregnancy, then you decrease it again post-delivery. Um, and then, so postpartum care for these women. So it's important to discontinue blood glucose lowering therapy immediately after birth, especially for GDM. Um, counsel about the risk of GDM in future pregnancies. There's a moderate risk of type 2 diabetes. So you offer lifestyle advice. And the GP basically needs to check their fasting plasma glucose at their six-week postnatal check. Or if that doesn't happen, then they can check the HbA1c after 13 weeks. And essentially, if the fasting glucose is over 7, then they're likely to have type 2 diabetes. If it's between 6 to 6.9, then there's a high risk of them developing type 2 diabetes. Yeah. So the important thing with GDM is discontinue the blood glucose lowering therapy because the pregnancy has ended. They don't have GDM anymore, but you'd counsel them about the risk and the GP would have to follow up in six weeks time with the fasting plasma glucose. Oh, what is BM? So it actually, yes, it's, it's blood glucose monitoring, but you're right, Andy, it's, sort of, it's to do with the manufacturers. I don't actually know what, I think it's like, I, I don't know what it stands for, but it's the manufacturer name. So BM, we shouldn't really be saying BM anymore. So it's blood glucose monitoring. Um, considerations for women with pre-existing diabetes. So someone who's got type one and type two diabetes. So preconception counseling is really important. So you wanna aim for a HbA1c preconception of under 48, which is 6.5%. You wanna give them high dose folic acid because these women are at increased risk of delivering babies with congenital malformations. So you want that high dose folic acid. Arrange dietitian review. You wanna stop oral uh, hypoglycemics because you know they're not safe in pregnancy, except for metformin. You'd also stop any statins, stop your ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and you want to check their eyes and their kidneys. This is for women with pre-existing diabetes. Um, for antenatal care, basically, um, for type 1 and type 2 diabetes, the main thing that you want to remember from this slide is you'd basically give them, ask them to deliver earlier. So elective birth between 37 and 38 plus 6 weeks. Before 37 weeks, if there's any complications. So GDM, you sort of, you can wait for a bit longer. You deliver a bit later with GDM. And postpartum, so I've mentioned already, reduce the insulin dose immediately after birth. Advise them to snack before and after feeds to reduce the risk of hypos. And just to remember, insulin and metformin are safe to use in breastfeeding, so they can continue on that. Okay, so just quickly about um, diabetes in pregnancy. So you've got a 24-year-old type 1 diabetic woman what would you do with her insulin requirements postpartum? Okay. Yeah. So most of you guys got the right answer. So it is B. So basically because she's eating and drinking, she, you don't need to, you can stop the sliding scale and you want to change her back to pre-pregnancy insulin because postpartum, the, you know, the requirements reduce. So then you can uh, basically change her back to that. So yeah. So the answer is B for this one.
Okay, so we're going to go through uh, preeclampsia now quickly in the last um, 20 minutes. So you've got a 38 year old woman, she's got headache, flashing lights, she's got a past medical history of SLE, base blood pressure, two plus protein in her urine, she's got all of these blood test results. What do we think is the most likely diagnosis? Sorry, I haven't given you the um, normal blood results. But just have a guess of what she could have. Okay. Yeah, so most of you guys got this right. This is a pretty straightforward one. So this is HELP syndrome, which is hemolysis. You've got the elevated liver. So you've got the low hemoglobin. You've got the elevated liver enzymes. So the raised ALT. Um, you, you, you'd also get a raised bilirubin as well and low platelets. So platelets are 55. And that's basically a complication of preeclampsia. Um, good. So the answer is B in that case. Okay. So we'll go through a case of high blood pressure. So you've got a 37 year old lady, 23 weeks into her pregnancy. She's had one previous SVD and one miscarriage at eight weeks. She's got a high blood pressure reading of 145 over 95 protein plus plus in her urine. What do we think is going on and how, so what sort of, what do we think is going on in her case? Preeclampsia, yes, we've got a pretty high risk of preeclampsia, pretty high suspicion for preeclampsia, sorry. How would we investigate this further? What would we do next? FPC, good. Anything else? Check her reflexes. Yes, you want to take a thorough history, examine her. Yes, ask about headaches, visual disturbances, exactly. Good. So... So essentially definition. So it's hypertension, you've got proteinuria, um, also consider sort of like the booking blood pressure as well. And it develops after 20 weeks and it resolves within six weeks of delivery. So the pathophysiology, this is actually from osmosis, is a really good video that explains that. So essentially you've got a poorly perfused placenta, which then results in the IUGR, which is the intrauterine growth restriction, fetal death. And these, you basically have vasoconstriction and the kidneys retaining more salt, both of these which result in the hypertension. So yeah, I definitely recommend watching the osmosis video because it, um, you know, it really explains the pathophysiology of developing preeclampsia. And essentially it's because of abnormal development of the placenta. Um, and what are some of the risk factors for developing preeclampsia? I think you guys have started to mention it already. What are some of the risk factors that we look at chronic hypertension yes smoking gdm family history increasing maternal age yes anything else sle yeah that's the risk factor good yes uh, over 10 years interval between pregnancies kidney failure ckd diabetes as well yes i think that was mentioned earlier actually um okay so some of the high risk Things are previous severe or early onset preeclampsia, chronic hypertension, CKD, diabetes, and autoimmune disease. So like antiphospholipid, thrombophilia, SLE. Moderate risk factors are if it's your first pregnancy, if you're over 40, pregnancy interval of over 10 years, BMI, you guys have mentioned as well, so over 30, family history of preeclampsia, and if, you're, if you have multiple pregnancy. So if you've got one high or two moderate risk factors, you basically give them aspirin 150 milligrams. So I think you guys were talking about earlier. So the lady, so ladies with type one or type two diabetes, yes, they would get, according to this criteria, because they already satisfy the one high risk, they, they'd get aspirin 150 milligrams. That was a good observation there. Um, so from, so they usually start from 12 weeks until delivery. And you, you basically need to start it under 16 weeks because it, um, helps to aid the trophoblastic invasion, which happens in the first trimester. So you want to give it, you want to start it quite early. So from 12 weeks until delivery. And it's aspirin 150 milligrams that you give them. So this just shows you some of the clinical sort of features. So symptoms, it, it might actually just, you might not have any symptoms in mild preeclampsia, but things you want to ask in every consultation are headaches, flashing lights, epigastric pain, nausea, vomiting, sudden swelling of the face, fingers, or lower limbs. 
On examination, so hypertension, proteinuria, epigastric tenderness, brisk reflexes, someone mentioned examining the reflexes, which is really good. Confusion fits, you can get seizures. Placental abruption as well, you can get an IUGR. Um, so estimated fetal weight of under 10 centile. That's how we define IUGR and stillbirth as well. So that's just to remember the HELP syndrome. Um, so how do we investigate preeclampsia? We've mentioned some of the blood test results. So you do FBC, clotting, you do LFTs as well, urine PCR and serum uric acid. Um, and when do we so when do we admit someone to the hospital? Because often a lot of these women can be managed really well in the community. What would be some of the things that would you know, make you admit? Seizures, definitely. Anything else? Fetal distress, over 160, uncontrolled blood pressure, good. Um, yeah, so BP. These are the main things. Yeah, so sustained systolic blood pressure of over 160. Any concerning biochemical investigations? So these women usually come into the maternity assessment unit once or twice a week to get their bloods done regularly. So if there's anything concerning on that, then they would admit them. Um, signs of pulmonary edema, impending eclampsia, suspected fetal compromise, signs of severe preeclampsia. So this just shows you the abnormal Doppler. So what you can get is you can get reduced. So the diastolic flow is basically when it comes down. So you can get reduced diastolic velocity. You can get absent and diastolic velocity, or you can get reversed. And basically reversed is the worst one. That it's, 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 um, it's worse than having reduced or absent and diastolic velocity. That's just some of the things you can get on the Dopplers. Um, how do we treat it? So you give them libitalol usually first line. You can give them the fedipine second line. You can give them methyl dopa a third line treatment. Um, target blood pressure, you want to keep it 135 over 85 or less. And you want to monitor that blood pressure at least every 48 hours and blood test twice a week. So fetal monitoring. So yeah, I've mentioned the ultrasound Doppler. You can do ultrasound for fetal growth as well. You check the amniotic fluid um, during these ultrasound scans. You want to repeat this every two weeks or earlier if there's anything like change in fetal movements, any vaginal bleeding, abdominal pain, deterioration in the maternal condition. So these women have quite a lot of follow-up. So they have blood pressure monitoring, they've got blood tests, they've got fe fetal monitoring as well. So those are all part of the treatment for preeclampsia because a lot of it's just monitoring them for any complications and knowing when to admit these women. So when it comes to delivery and birth, so you want to deliver a woman after 37 weeks, when would you consider delivering before? So we've mentioned already any neuro symptoms, any seizures, abruption, abnormal Doppler, so like the reversed flow on the Doppler or abnormal CTG, which is always like an indication for considering for expediting delivery, um, deterioration in bloods, difficulty controlling the blood pressure, uh, preterm delivery, if, if you are, you know, delivering someone preterm, you need to discuss them with neonates and give them IV magnesium sulfate and again, give them corticosteroids before 37 weeks. And intrapartum, regular monitoring of blood pressure, continue hypertensives. Um, if they've got uncontrolled hypertension, so that's one of the indications for uh, forceps delivery or just any kind of instrumental delivery because you don't want these women with uncontrolled hypertension to have very prolonged second stages. That's just something to consider. Um, and postpartum, again, you want to repeat their PET bloods. Um, consider reducing it, uh, the, the, blood, the blood pressure medication if the blood pressure falls below 140 over 90. If they, they, these women are discharged on treatment, the GP basically reviews them in six weeks. If, they, if they're not discharged on any treatment, if the blood pressure completely normalizes, then basically GP, GP reviews them in six weeks time. And you know, then, then they can decide to restart the medication or not to give them any medication anymore. Yeah, so it's really important postpartum to keep these women in, check their blood pressure, repeat the PET bloods, make sure that the bloods have normalized um, postpartum. Okay, so if you do have eclampsia, what do you do? So you just do a, use an A to E approach. You can give them magnesium sulfate to treat the seizures. Repeat the seizures, then treat it with diazepam. Regular observations are really important. Catheter to monitor urine output, send off the, all the bloods that you would usually send off and monitor for signs of magnesium toxicity. So signs of magnesium toxicity are best rate of under 12. You'd get loss of tendon reflexes and a low urine output. Do you guys know what the antidote is for magnesium sulfate? Calcium gluconate, good. Um, So the Dopplers are the umbilical artery Dopplers. You can also get, um, oh, there's another one. There's a cerebral, 
I don't know if it's vein or artery. There's another one that you can look at in the baby's brain as well. That's sort of done later on in the pregnancy, but most of them are umbilical artery doctors. Um, when do we, why do we get brisk reflexes with preeclampsia? That's a very good question. I have no idea why you get it. The magnesium sulfate is basically, it helps with neuroprotection and it also helps um, lower the seizure threshold as well. So it helps to treat the seizures. So you can give it as prophylaxis, but yeah, so a lot of the other reason why it helps is because of the neuroprotection for the fetus. Um, and it prevents the seizures. Uh, calcium gluconate, yes, it's MCA, good, yeah. So it's middle cerebral artery that you give. Um, what are PET bloods? So PET bloods are FPC, use the knees, LFTs, creatinine. So all the ones that I mentioned over here, clotting as well. Those are your preeclampsia bloods. Um, and then CTG, so yeah, so and you do CTG for fetal heart, fetal heart rate monitoring as well. Um, and you want to deliver them, de deliver the baby once the mom is stable. So you want to treat the seizures, give them magnesium sulfate, regular observations, check for fetal distress. And once the mom is stable, then you'd basically deliver the baby. Um, just always think of other causes of seizures as well. So things like cere I mean, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis is very rare, but pregnancy does increase your risk of getting that. Intracranial mass, stroke, hypoglycemia. So don't ever forget checking the glucose, hyponatremia, signs of infection. So just think outside the box. It might not be eclampsia. It might be some of the, these other things as well. Okay, so I think this is the last question actually. So you've got a 26 year old woman admitted at 34 weeks gestation with preterm labor. Uh, she's got a raised blood pressure, urine shows three plus protein urea. And she's got late D cells, fetal heart rate of 90 per minute. What's the next step? Okay, so if you can show the poll results. Yeah, so again, this lady as well would go for an emergency cesarean section. So I think you guys have probably gotten very good at knowing which women you know, you'd, you'd um, give them emergency C-sections for. So again, in this case, late D cells, fetal bradycardia, she's got reduced fetal movements. Yeah, you wanna do something pretty like straight away. So yeah, she'd get an emergency cesarean section. And I just checked for you guys. So it is middle cerebral artery that you'd look at. Um, on the Doppler. And essentially you can look at it for fetal anemia and fetal hypoxia. And someone has asked, um, would you ever just induce labor if there was less fetal distress? Yes, you might think about doing that. So, you know, if, if, if it's not, because with CTGs, as you guys might remember, you know, you can um, divide CTGs into pathological, non-reassuring or normal uh, CTG. So if it's not pathological, you might decide to induce labor. But obviously it's sort of, it's very much, so I think with, with med school questions, they don't really ask you about like the in-between cases because that's sort of a lot more complex. It requires like senior-led decision-making. They just need you to de decide, you know, they, they need you to be able to know what a pathological CTG is and when you would do something as an emergency, so like the emergency cesarean section. So yeah, there definitely would be cases where you would just induce someone because you, do, you don't want to give everyone cesarean sections. So if it wasn't a pathological CTG, if they think that all you need is to expedite the delivery by induct, inducing someone, then yeah, they might go for that. Um, so yeah, so with magnesium toxicity, you can get loss of reflexes, that's right. Okay, so that is the end. Thanks guys for staying. So yeah, so we've covered all of these topics today. Um, happy to take any more questions if you guys have any questions. And um, yeah, I was, a lot of people asked before actually where I got my questions from. So there's this 450 single best answers in clinical specialties. So this is the book that I use and it's got, um, it's, I think some of the questions are a bit outdated, but I thought it was good because of all the explanations. So some of the questions are a little bit, so I would take them with a pinch of salt, but the, the bit that it's useful for is it gives you like a whole paragraph, like explanation for why it's one option and not the other, which is why I thought it was quite useful. And it's got all the clinical specialties. So it's got Obs and Gynae, it's got Pete. So that's where I took some of my 
answers for uh, some of the MCQs from. I also use PassMed as well. And yeah, so NICE has really good um, guidelines for preeclampsia and GDM. Um, and osmosis is really good for like pathophysiology, all of like your OSCE scenarios and stuff. Um, but yeah, here's a feedback link and thank you.